Hello and welcome to my class. In this video, I am going to discuss the biology of Chylo infascatulus, commonly known as sugarcane stem borer. It is a major pest of sugarcane. This lecture is the third part of the series on pests of sugarcane. I discussed the biology of Pyrilla purpusilla in the first part and Scipophaga nivella in the second part. You can find the links of those videos in the description box. Sugarcane is one of the most important crops worldwide. The scientific name of sugarcane is Saccharum officinarum. It belongs to the grass family Graminae or Poaceae. The plants grow up to 2 to 6 meters and they have jointed and fibrous stalks. Sucrose accumulates in the stalk internodes and this sucrose is extracted for sugar production. Sugar canes are used for 79% of global sugar production. Here is a map of sugarcane cultivation distribution and you can see that sugarcane is cultivated in many countries in the world. India is one of the major producers of sugarcane. This map should also give you the idea how important sugarcane is for agricultural economy. So now let's talk about one of the most important pests of sugarcane, the sugarcane stem borer or chylo infascatulus. To talk about the biology of this pest, I am going to discuss the systematic position or taxonomic status, identification and distribution, habits, life cycle, nature of damage, as well as control. Starting with systematic position, Chylo infascatulus belongs to phylum Arthropoda, subphylum Uniremia, class Insecta, subclass Pterygota, division Endopterygota, order Lepidoptera, family Crambidae or Pyralidae, genus Chylo, species Chylo infascatulus. Here for family, I have given two names, Crambidae and Pyralidae. The reason is that these two families are very close to each other. They are very similar to each other. And some authors classify Chylo under family Crambidae and some authors classify Chylo under family Pyralidae. Crambidae and Pyralidae, both families belong to superfamily Pyraloidea. Let's talk about the distribution of Chylo infascatulus. You can see that it is abundantly found in Southeast Asia. If we magnify the map, you can see that in India, Chylo is very widely distributed. It is found almost everywhere in India. It is also found in Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Korea, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. Even in Australia continent, in Papua New Guinea, Chylo infascatulus have been reported. How can we identify this moth? There are two, three important points. First one is that the adult moth is straw colored and measures about 1.5 inches in wingspan. So, if we stretch the wings and measure from this point to this point, it would be about 1.5 inch. The four wings are straw colored as seen in here, but the hind wings are grayish white. So, when the insect sits at rest, you can only see the straw colored four wings, but if the wings are stretched, then hind wings are visible and they are grayish white in color. The labial palpi are pointed forward. By looking at these characteristics, we can identify Chylo infascatulus. About the life cycle, any Lepidopteran insect's life cycle would have these stages. The adult would lay eggs, the eggs would hatch into larva or caterpillar, the caterpillar would pupate and the pupa will again emerge as the adult. Now let's put this design into the life cycle of Chylo infascatulus. Here we can see that the females would lay the eggs and the eggs would take about a week to hatch into caterpillar. The caterpillar will take about 21 days or 3 weeks to go through 5 molds and then they will pupate. The pupa will emerge as the adult in 7 to 9 days. There will be 5 to 7 generations in a year. If the weather is warmer, there will be more generations and if the weather is colder, then there will be fewer generations because insects tend to take longer to complete their life cycle if the temperature is colder and they take shorter period of time to finish their life cycle if the weather is warmer. Now let's talk about each life cycle stage in detail. 
I have already talked about the identifying features of the adults. So, I am not repeating it here. I am going to start with the eggs. The eggs are laid in small batches on the underside of leaves near the midrib or on stem. It can either be laid near the midrib in the leaves or it can also be laid on the stem. The number of eggs per batch ranges from 10 to 80. The egg hatches in about a week. The larvae are dull white in color with a number of brownish red longitudinal stripes on the back. A fully grown larva measures about 2.5 centimeters in length, so about an inch. The significant characteristic feature of the larvae is that they bore in and bore out a number of times either in the same stalk or in the neighboring wards. So that way they don't only damage one plant but also the neighboring wards. The larval period lasts for about three weeks, after which the larvae pupates in the, the larva pupates in the tunnel within the sugarcane stalk where they had been feeding before. So the eggs are hatched on the underside of the leaves, but other than that, chyloinfascatellus insect in any life cycle stages have nothing to do with the leaves. They just bore uh, a hole into the stem and they go inside the stem. So the larva remains within the stem and they feed on the tissue within the stem. Sometimes in case of chylo, they come out of the stem and they can then crawl to another plant nearby and they can bore a hole in the stem of that plant. That way they damage multiple plants in the same life cycle. The pupal period lasts a little more than a week after which the moth emerges out from the exit hole prepared by the larva before pupation. Just like we saw in Scirpophaga nivella, here also the larva bores a hole for its exit after pupation so that when the pupa emerges as the adult, it does not have to do any extra work. It can just come out of the stem very easily through that exit hole made in its larval stage. During winter moths, uh, during winter months, the larvae undergo hibernation. So the larvae would hibernate in the beginning of winter inside the stems and after the winter, they will come out of hibernation. So they will remain inactive within the stems throughout the winter and after winter, they will pupate and after pupation, they will emerge as the adults. Let's talk about its habits. The caterpillar bores into the central shoot and makes a tunnel through several roots. It feeds on stem contents or the tissue inside the stem and pupates in the tunnel. Adult moths are nocturnal like any other moth. There are four to five roots in the active period from March to October. Larvae hibernate in winter among sugarcane stubbles. They pupate in February and emerge as moths in March, just like I said before. There are many other plants which can be used as alternate hosts by Chyloinfus catalus. Some of them are Bajra, Guinea grass, etc. Let's talk about uh, how the Chyloinfus catalus larvae damage the plants. It is most injurious to the younger plants. So if chylo attack happens in younger plants, then there is a huge loss because most of the plants would die. The damage is done by the caterpillars which bore into the same stem. Here you can see a boring hole and then they feed in the soft tissue within the stem. While feeding, the caterpillars move move upward as well as they dig downward and may reach the roots. They also cause dead heart. What is dead heart? Dead heart is when the larva feeds in the tissue here at the central topmost part of the plant and as a result the growing part dry, dries up and it dies. So this central shoot will become dry and brown and the plant will not be able to grow anymore. This feature or this characteristic symptom done by Chyloinfus catalus is known as dead heart. Infestation of internodes make the matured cane 
hard and devoid of juice which becomes difficult to make. So, if they become hard and if there is no juice, then obviously it will become difficult to extract the juice from the stem. And due to the tunnel formation, both quality and quantity of the juice is reduced. If there is a gap inside the stem, obviously there won't be any juice inside and that way the quantity of the juice is also reduced and because the larvae feed on the tissue, the quality of the juice is also reduced. The pest can uh, cause up to 50% of crop damage in case of sugarcane. Now let's talk about how we can control Kylo infus catalysis. There are various methods. First one is cultural method. Either we can use early plantation by the middle of February because that is the time when the hibernated larvae have not gone into pupation. So before they go into pupation, if the plantation happens, then the plants will grow a little longer so that the pupated larvae or the pupated or hibernated uh, larvae uh, when they come out as adults they cannot cause enough damage to the young crop okay so we need to basically avoid the window when the hibernated moths would come out as the adult and our plants should be mature enough by that time to withstand the damage by Kylo infus catalus larva because it is very injurious to young plants. Young plants cannot survive if there is a Kylo attack. By adjusting the time of plantation of the cane and emergence of moth, the two should not coincide with each other. Use of resistant variety of sugarcane. There are many sugarcane varieties which are resistant to Lepidopteran attack. So, by using biotechnological tools, uh, scientists have developed many resistant variety of sugarcane. Those can be cultivated to avoid the damage done by Kylo infus catalysis. After harvesting, the field should be ploughed, stubble should be collected and burned because within these stubbles, Kylo larvae can hibernate. So, we want to remove those stubbles and burn them so that Kylo cannot come out for the next generation. Let's talk about the mechanical methods. Uh, collection and destruction of egg masses, it can reduce the density of the pest. Uh, removal of affected plants having dead heart right from the ground level. Care should be taken that the larvae and pupae may not come out from the removed plants. So, if you see dead heart or if you see boring holes into the plants, then obviously there is stem borer attack in those plants. So, if we remove those plants, then we are also removing the larva within those plants. So, they should be removed and destroyed so that the insects cannot come out of those plants and re-attack the fresh plants. Spiking the larvae with iron needle, use of pheromone traps. Now, except for pheromone traps, these things may not be very practical if you have a very large sugarcane field. If there are a few plants or if you have a very small field, then these methods can be very, very effective. But for a large sugarcane field, these methods are not very practical. So, what do we need to do uh, to keep the damages to a minimum level? We can use the chemical control. Spraying gamma BHC heptachlor or telodrine emulsion at the rate of 1 to 3 kg per hectare mixed with 1500 liters of water can be very effective. These are organochlorine pesticides. Okay. Spraying should be done at the interval of 15 days for the first 3 months. So, once organochlorine pesticides are sprayed, they persist in nature for a long time. So, the larvae when they come out of one stem and they try to attack another plant, at that time if they ingest these organochlorine pesticides, then they would die. So, that is what we are targeting here. We can also use biological methods because chemicals are not good for the crop as well as for the consumers of the crop. So, preference should be towards using biological methods. Egg parasitoids, larval parasitoids and pupal parasitoids can all be used to control the uh, pest in the field. 
Now let's recap the whole lecture. Uh, for systematic position, Chyloinfascatellus belongs to order Lepidoptera, family Crambidae or Pyralidae. It can be identified with its straw colored forewings and white hind wings and it is found all over South Asia. The habits is boring through the stem making tunnels. In winter, the larva hibernates. Life cycle will include egg, caterpillar, pupa and adult stages. You can identify Scirpo, uh, sorry, Chylo infascatellus attack by looking at dead central shoot holes or tunnels in the stem and you can control Chylo infascatellus by using chemical, cultural, mechanical and biological control methods. Hope you like the video. I am going to make a summary video later on where I will discuss the comparison of Pyrilla purpusilla, Scirpophaga nivella and Chylo infascatellus. So come back for that. All the information in this video are taken from various textbooks as well as from the websites of agricultural universities.